Buongiorno. Hello, everybody. Um, so, uh, here is the title of my talk, The Infinite Game of Vulnerability Research. Please, next slides. Oh, I can... Con okay. I can move it for you. Oh, uh, okay. Oh. So, short introduction. Uh, who is this guy in front of you? Uh, I'm David Caligaris. That is my Twitter handle, and I work in Italy for a very long time. Um, I was in a company called the Maze Network that at the moment is acquired by other companies, it's not anymore there. And I was a developer of a security scanner called the Legion. There are in this room other people that share with me this, this task, and then I become the CTO. After that, uh, I joined in 2017 Huawei in Germany, and I have two teams, one that is working on fuzzing, and we will talk a lot about that today, and user space and kernel space area, and then uh, I am running the Huawei bug bounty program on mobile phones. So I am the guy that organized this secret conference in Munich a few years ago, where we started and announced the bug bounty program. If you see me around, you can ask me information about bug bounty, fuzzing, whatever. I'm super happy to talk with people working in security. Oh. One uh, disclaimer, this is my personal view and don't represent the view of my employee. So what we will talk about today. So the title of the company, the Infinite Game. The final game uh, is about game theory. And then uh, we will speak about vulnerability research and we will touch topics like variant analysis, fuzzing, manual code analysis, or manual code review. Game theory. So game theory is uh, the science of decision making. I think you know Russell Crowe that have nothing to do with uh, game theory but is the actor that interprets John Nash. I think that John Nash is the most recognizable person for game theory. It's uh, something that uh, pop-ups from uh, John von Neumann. Uh, he was playing poker and want to find some mathematical model behind it. And game theory is the science of making decisions. And then uh, a game is defined as the interactions among uh, multiple actors and the gains of these actors are influence each other. But for a better uh, definition, we have there. And then uh, in game theory, we have two thinkers, not more, most on mathematics, but uh, influential thinkers, we can say, that they introduced the topic of finite and infinite games. We have James Cars in 86, and then we have Simon Sinek in 2019. So let's see what is a finite game and an infinite game. So finite games are the most uh, games that we know and we are used it. Are played by no players, they have fixed rules. In finite games we have objects and when they reach these objects, the game is ended. We are all agree on that. There is a beginning, a middle and an end. And there is a clear winner and a loser. In finite games, there are all the time new players coming and going in these games and are played by no and no players. There, are no exact, uh, there is not a precise agreement on rules. Players can change how they play the game in finite time horizon. And there is no clear thing what means winning or losing an infinite game. The goal of an infinite game is to stay in the game as long as possible. So for example, uh, Exam uh, for example, business is an example of infinite game. So business before, born before us and will end as will continue after our life. But I see a lot of analogies uh, with infinite games with vulnerability research. So what is uh, vulnerability research? We vulnerability research is a process that is uh, allowing us to find flows in software, or also hardware, or we will see in the afternoon, that could lead to security issues. 
And the process is done by static code analysis, dynamic testings, and so on. Who is doing um, vulnerability research? Internal of your organization, if you have a product, you have people that are doing DUST, SAS, the dynamic security testing, static security testing, penetration test teams. And you have also people that are doing vulnerability research out of the company, back bounty hunters, bad actors, academia, and so on. Why to do vulnerability research? Finding, and of course, patching vulnerabilities is an effective way to make software more secure and making internet a safer place for us, for all, for all of us. And then it can be quite remunerative. So here on the screenshots here, we see a company that is offering 100,000 USD dollars for a vulnerability in a chat software, Pigeon. And then below, you see a very, mm, how we can say, curious reply from uh, the maintainer of the software. And the maintainer is saying that he is uh, struggling to have 25K to continue the development of the software for one year. And then uh, here we see that uh, a company that is acquiring zero days is offering four times the money for uh, getting a vulnerability in it. So it's a little bit a uh, disequilibrium in that. So let's uh, put together the idea of infinite game with um, vulnerability research. So we have all the time new vulnerability researchers that join the game, and we have also players playing in the defense. Vulnerability research includes only software, only hardware. We have uh, Spectre, Meltdown, that they open a totally new area. We have uh, the introduction of uh, memory-safe language that kill a lot of vulnerabilities. And this changed how players was playing the game. We have introduction of gray box fuzzing. And then do we know how uh, vulnerability research will end? We have a clear picture in mind. And of course, can we define who is a winner in cybersecurity? Who was the winner of last year? The winner of own to own the winner of uh, Tianfu Cup. Who is the winner? We, who is defining who is a winner or a loser? So let's see a little bit a timeline how this game was played. When uh, vulnerability research, when cybersecurity born, maybe with the first paper or with buffer overflows in the 76, I think, or will be the Morris worm, the worm that was moving from with uh, exploiting a stuck buffer overflow on finger on a, a Solaris machine. Or is uh, with the, the paper uh, smashing the stack for find and profit in 98. And then here we see on the below area the things that are happening in offensive. And in green area we see the things that are happening in, uh, in the defensive side. And uh, when I draw this line I share it with some friends. And we was not agree on a lot of things. So this means that this is an example of an infinite game. What we include, oh, a friend of mine say, oh, you must include the sandboxing. Oh, but uh, why you don't include browsers protections and so on? So the game is expanding, uh, shrinking. You, they say somebody, why you don't include some specific features that Windows add or another operating system add and so on? So we are not agree everybody what is included and so on. And this make a perfect analogy on what is an infinite game. Um, so, how is uh, vulnerability research done? We have uh, some emerging techniques that uh, currently are quite used. Variant analysis, fuzzing, and then there is still manual code review. We will do a little uh, drill down on these topics, but uh, after me you will have two amazing speakers. Uh, one will speak and go in deep about fuzzing, that is also the area where I'm working. And then we'll have, where is the other speaker? I don't see it in the audience. we we'll speak about variant analysis. Or variant analysis. So how we come aware of vulnerabilities inside our products? We can become aware internal to the organization or external to the organization. 
We have coding scanning solutions, dynamic testing, in, uh, internal security teams. We can run on pods that they catch exploits. And then we can have threat intelligence information. But uh, we have also sources outside the company. So maybe I am a company, I have my product, I can take a company that is very good in some vertical areas, and we can ask them to perform a pen testing. Or we can have a bug bounty program and we can get um, uh, vulnerabilities via a coordinated or uh, responsible disclosure program. In some cases, they are not optimal, but we can, have, we can become aware of vulnerabilities in our product via full disclosure, or we discover that uh, they are exploited directly on the wild. So when one of these uh, um, vulnerabilities uh, reach our organization, we need to set up some project. So first of all, we need to patch the vulnerability. This is something that we need to do to make our software more secure. But then we need uh, to start uh, multiple processes. So how we can prevent uh, similar bugs from happening again? We need to train our developers to don't do that mistakes. We need to change the language. Maybe don't write still code in C, but start to write in Rust, Go, that are memory safe languages. Or can we kill the vulnerability class? So here there are amazing examples. So around 2008, there was a uh, Cambrian explosion, as somebody will use, of uh, vulnerabilities that are called the null pointer in the Linux kernel. But then uh, the vulnerability was, uh, the total vulnerability class was killed, not allowing any more uh, code execution by not allowing to map the null address from user space and redirect the execution from there. Or, for example, another thing that we do, we can say, oh, if we cannot kill the vulnerability class, can we make the exploitation harder or impossible? But then there is another important question. How we find, so we know that bugs try to repeat, and maybe a developer is making again and again the same mistakes in other parts of the code. How we can find other variations of the same vulnerability in our project or in other coded bases that this developer is working? Okay, so by variant analysis, we define the process that uh, allows us uh, to find other vulnerabilities using as a seed the no vulnerabilities that we receive from the previous sources. So here there are two examples quite different from each other. And one is somehow geek funny, because the guy says here is in 2021, he grab for. So in 2021, we find vulnerabilities with grab. This must tell us something about what is uh, still cybersecurity. And then in the other article, you see a guy that is saying that he's using a, pro a software that is called CodeQL to look at uh, the source code. So let's see how these softwares allow us to find vulnerabilities. Of course, we can grow, uh, use grab, but maybe it's not the most efficient way that we can use for vulnerabilities, but there are new technologies rising on the market that uh, could allow us to find these vulnerabilities. So we start, this is the starting point. We have our source code, and we have our security bugs knowledge that we receive from all the sources that I get it, that we get, uh, I showed before, and um, is there from a lot of years, so it's a very huge archive, maybe. So we can take our source code, use a parsing engine, and this uh, uh, parsing engine can put our code in a sort of database and put in a special graph representation in it. And uh, we can take uh, our security bugs uh, knowledge and we can model that is a security bug knowledge in sort of queries of templates that allow us to perform like, I would say, like a sort of SQL queries in our software and look for variations of the similar vulnerabilities. Um, there are several products that are aiming to do that. There are commercial, open source, and so on. We have very famous CodeQL, we have SimGrab, we have Cochinelle, we have Google Project Zero Wegly, we have Shift Left Yearn, and so on. And uh, it's a uh, from what I read and what I, I'm doing is a quite uh, effective way to identify vulnerabilities. Fuzzing. So 
what is fuzzing? So we can uh, write the definition here, but I like more explain it uh, as I will explain to my grandparents. So let's uh, see. I think that uh, several people of you one day opened by mistake a PDF file with Notepad, and then you see a random bunch of characters. And then uh, what happens if you take these characters that you see in Notepad, you change it, and you open again it with the PDF editor? Actually, you are performing a super primitive way of fuzzing. It's not efficient and so on, but uh, if you take this Notepad file, you change the data inside, and you open again the file, and the, uh, the, um, the viewer that you are using is crashing, you find a bug. And there are chances that this is a security bug. So doing this manually is not quite effective, and, but we can automate. So here we have a pseudocode of what a fuzzer looks like. We have an engine, in this case our while, and then uh, we have our mutator. We can take the corpus, change the file, and uh, the corpus, I mean, is the initial archive of files that we have. We can uh, pass uh, the, uh, the file to our software under test, and if the software under test crash, we have a crash detector, and they say, oh, inspect it, and see if this is a bug. So this is how fuzzing works. Do you think this way is effective, or is too primitive? Who thinks this is effective? Some hands up. Oh, well, oh thank you. <laughs> OK, next. It's extremely effective. So here we have uh, several security researchers that are saying that they are using it and integrating in their vulnerability research lifecycle. And then we have several research also from Google Project Zero that are saying that they are using fuzzing to find bugs. And uh, to prove that, uh, and not just to, uh, to be biased by an opinion because we like it, uh, there is a project for, uh, from Google that is called Google OSS Fuzz that, is, uh, that identify more 30,000 bugs in uh, 500 uh, open source projects. Um, just a note, because sometimes I speak about fuzzing and I see people confuse it because uh, they come to me and say, oh, I fuzz too and I have a long list of directories to, for web servers. This is not, this thing have the same word at the moment on internet, but there are two different things. This thing is, call it, uh, in my opinion, directory brute forcing of web server enumeration. So we are not talking about this type of fuzzing. Next. So here are some fuzzing concepts that I want to introduce because will help to understand the things later. So in this diagram, we have something that is the evolution of fuzzers. So we started black box as we end up before. We changed the file without any particular uh, logic and so on. And then uh, we can uh, uh, we have two branches that fuzzing take in the in the in the last years. We have grammar or uh, format fuzzing that was using uh, the format of the file and the binary structures to the file to provide good inputs, very well formatted. Or we have feedback-driven fuzzer and then the use of sanitizers that allows to detect uh, memory violations in a better way. And now we see a merge of these uh, uh, two approaches. And then uh, maybe you heard me speaking a lot of time about RNS. The RNS, if you see the three pieces of, uh, of the puzzle there, is the piece of software that allows to connect the fuzzing engine with uh, your software under test. So you remember this slide at the beginning when we speak about variant analysis. So here we have uh, some questions that we need to do. We need to patch the vulnerability. We need to perform variant analysis to find other things. But in my opinion, there is another question that we should add in our SDLC process. Why our fuzzers didn't find the same vulnerability that we receive from the other sources? And here I want to introduce a project that is called Vulnerability Rediscovery, that uh, is, I can say, quite well explained by uh, Live Overflow in his YouTube streams. But basically, when uh, we receive in the bug bounty program, let's say, a memory corruption vulnerability in the parsing of some uh, image file or some other 
binary structure or whatever, why we, our fuzzing farm didn't find it? We didn't write the harness. We didn't use a very good set of initial inputs, maybe a good set of PDF files. We don't mutate in the correct way. We don't use the sanitizer, so the thing that allows us to catch memory corruptions and so on. And uh, most important of all is, do we have other parts of our code where I did not, uh, I use the term tame our fuzzer correctly, where I didn't instruct my fuzzer to do the same thing. And maybe I am working on both on client and server in parsing a data structure. Why? I, I must maybe do the same checks also to the other side. I want to introduce other two topics, but here I need a little bit of interactions because everybody is sleeping at the moment. And uh, so this is a URL. And I think this is uh, the best way to explain what is differential analysis. And then we will see how differential analysis can be used also for fuzzing. So what is the IP address uh, that this uh, URL, uh, this uh, input, uh, will make our browser, our software to, to connect? Is 1111-2222-3333. Some options, some interactions, please be alive. Who is saying one, one, one? How many hands in up? One, two, three, four, okay, more, 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 more. We say two, 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 two. Okay, less, three, 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 three. Who say none? Who say something different? All of them in the same time. Okay, good idea. Uh, so this is the result. So depends on the library that you use, you have different behaviors and I mean, the same Python libraries, so in the same programming language. So these are three very popular Python libraries. And when uh, you pass it, so let's say that, I don't know, in the front end, you use one Python library, in the back end, you use another Python library, or in different parts of the code for some needs, you use different Python libraries, and you have different outcomes. And this is what is uh, differential analysis. So you take the same input, and then you use uh, different softwares to see if they treat the same input in the same way. And this is a perfect case study for combining fuzzing with it. And so we see, for example, now uh, there is a proposal to introduce uh, this test in the Linux kernel to see the different implementations in the syscalls. And uh, who is investing in crypto here? Ah, come on, alive, a little bit. So differential fuzzing is quite used to test uh, different crypto protocols for the consensus and uh, for finding bugs. And uh, then uh, to see that is an effective way, there is an article of, uh, I think, a uh, few weeks, no, one month ago, I think, more or less, oh, 23 September, that is uh, from uh, Google Tag, that they got that a group of uh, bad actors was using a different, uh, was exploiting how two different uh, certificate parsers was treating a certificate, and this allowed them to bypass some protections. So I think that the differential fuzzing will be something that we will see growing in the next years, especially, so now we examine fuzzing, especially for memory corruptions vulnerabilities, but we have languages like Go, Rust, and so on, that are not subject of memory corruptions, but you still use fuzzing to spot bugs. And uh, I think is uh, a very good thing that language starts to born with fuzzing capabilities from the beginning. And then uh, there is another trend that we see that is fuzz-driven development. So that you need to write your code that is more easy to perform fuzzing. Manual code review is one of the last points. Um, so by discussing with uh, several security researchers, uh, they say that, oh, how you find bugs? So I speak with guys that was uh, working at pwn to one competition or something like that. And uh, I asked them, what you, what, how you find vulnerabilities? What you do? You are, um, you are participating to pwn to one so you must be good. What is your opinion on that? And 
for them and also for me, one of the best uh, way to find vulnerabilities is manual code analysis. Seems very old, but it's still one of the most effective to find bugs, especially because it brings novelty. There are some researchers, and here we have different opinions, I think also in the audience, that says that fuzzing and variant analysis allow to find only two types of bugs. Low-hanging fruit, so bugs that are super easy to catch, or hard to spot vulnerabilities. I don't know, a memory corruption in V8 that can be found just with hours, hours, hours of fuzzing. And uh, we need to think uh, about a fact that fuzzing and variant analysis must not be a replacement of manual analysis. It must be a tool that supports our manual analysis to get it better. I think uh, this is a tweet that I, I really like and uh, it's about a guy that is very famous on the fuzzing scene and uh, says that automation is uh, the result of uh, understanding out automatable problem. So if you never do the manual work, it's very hard to identify what you need to automate. So I think that uh, are still a key for innovation, research, and to progress in this infinite game should be still manual code review. Are we are with time, Marco? Yeah, here is the 10 minutes. Okay, perfect. I have even less. I am almost on the last slides. Okay, conclusions. So as you know, I am a manager, and if I don't have a slide with this airplane, you don't prove that you are a manager. So it's mandatory. So when you become a man, there is a friend that says, if you give a keynote, you are a security researcher that is playing golf or is close to retirement. So I hope not, but yeah, I need to include a management slide at the end to understand it. So I think everybody knows what is this airplane. This is the emblem of um, survival bi survivorship bias. So during World War II, they start to uh, collect data on the planes that was coming back to the bases and where they receive uh, bullets. And say, oh, look, all the planes that come back to the base, uh, they have bullets in these and these and these and these parts. We should enforce these parts and we should uh, make them more robust. But uh, there was a mistake in this analysis. It was the planes that was coming back to the base. So it means that these planes was actually good because they survive. They didn't have the data of the planes that was destroyed. And maybe, maybe, these planes was uh, the planes that, the, the, the hits that these planes receive was in the parts that should be more protected. So, what I'm doing now, I speak about variant analysis to use them as a seed and so on. Do we have a survival bias? So we are getting these vulnerabilities and then we find variations. But are, what are the vulnerabilities that we don't catch? And how we can catch these vulnerabilities that are not catch? How we can avoid a scope bias and finding other vulnerabilities that at the moment are not detected? So. I am working with uh, security teams and in research development for many years, and it's not an easy task. So one of the things is that uh, several teams focus on the wrong goals. So they focus on, oh, you must find for the end of the year 10 vulnerabilities in this software. But it's not something that you can control. You don't know how many vulnerabilities you have in the software and so on. But instead, uh, I push my team for something that is called novelty research. So if you are a manager, you are doing pen testing with your team and so on. I really suggest that this book that is about novelty search and is about how to trigger serendipity discoveries in research, uh, in research and development teams. Other thing that I will suggest if you work for a vendor, don't limit your test with source code, but uh, perform security testing as also backdoctors doing. I'm not meaning to do just one, but do both. 
First of all, engineers like challenges. If you have an engineer and you say to him, oh, you have infinite money, you have infinite time, put this rocket on the moon. Nobody will be got on the moon because they find it not challenging. Say to the guy, oh, you need, uh, you have one year to do that. You need to do the rocket super light because we don't have money. You need uh, to do this with these and these restraints. Come on, the engineer is triggered. I want to do that. If you are lucky in the requirements and so on, you don't change to challenge the engineers enough to put the effort on that. And again, don't focus only on automation, but uh, go ahead also for manual code analysis. This is uh, what is trigger innovation, what allows you to, uh, to push and find new ways to test your software before backdoctors are doing. I want to close with this uh, one slide. So I had a lot of discussions about um, uh, this presentation with friends and so on during beers. And then uh, one guy in the WhatsApp group make uh, a very good uh, comment. And I, I asked him, can you tweet it and I will put you in the keynote? And he did it. <laughs> so <laughs> so he, he has his, follow him on Twitter now. I'm kidding, he's a good friend. And uh, he, he, he spot a very good point that normally inside the company you go, oh, find all the bugs possible and so on, and say instead hackers work in a different way or bad actors work in a different way. They focus on a goal. They want to have RSE, full remote chain on the device and so on. And uh, this allows them to ignore a lot of wounds and then find other things uh, that maybe with the first process are missing. So I think this is the perfect way how you should uh, conduct vulnerability research inside of your team. Apply both methodologies. Think how to kill all the bugs, working on source code and so on, but then add also the, uh, the methodology that hackers are doing. That's all, guys. Questions?